Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, the intention is to talk about uh, smart transit technologies and especially how we can fit them into new cities uh, or cities that don't have a system, uh, an already existing system, or to improve systems that are already there. Um, First of all, uh, and, and just a quick introduction, as you know, Bombardier is a, is a company that operates pretty much everywhere in the world, more than 60 cities. Uh, I am covering uh, the Latin American area, and, and what we're seeing there, uh, which is quite dramatic, is the growth of uh, urban population. We see that by 2050, uh, it seems that 90% of the Latin American population will live in towns and cities. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, but trends seem to be going that way. Uh, so this puts a special demand on more uh, facilities and, and uh, especially more urban transit, especially in cities, big cities that we have there that have no systems or, or very, very old, uh, inefficient systems. What are the demands? What's coming? Uh, what are we seeing there that has to be changed? Uh, and it's not only change; uh, it's not going to change necessarily uh, in an easy way. But first of all, uh, we need to change from an individual motorized transport system to something significantly more efficient. And of course, if possible, if possible, in, in a, with an electric uh, transportation solution, so we don't pollute not only in general, but we don't pollute in the urban areas in which people are, uh, is living. We need to have systems that are flexible uh, and not only uh, fix the the big uh, demands in terms of transportation from one place to the other, but also be able to fit into a city that is already consolidated, that is already full, and that already has significant traffic. That, and that's the situation of most of the big cities in Latin America. Uh, the infrastructure is falling behind significantly, and now they have to catch up. And and, and there's no really, there's not a lot of uh, uh, time or opportunity to basically rethink the city. We have instead to find opportunities into using the the, the already limited space and fit the best system possible. Uh, we need also, uh, and that's another uh, big opportunity area, to have systems that are efficient door-to-door -door transportation systems. One of the big issues we, we have seen in most of these cities and, and, and pretty much everywhere in the world is that even if you implement an efficient system from point A to B, 90% of the, of the times people has to go uh, the last mile with a different system. So there's a, a multiplicity of, of alternatives that have to be placed at the, at the station so the, the user can go really from door to door as they use with their cars. The reality today is that what has been, a, has prolified in most of these places is the very small micro buses. And, and basically you have in a, in a section uh, in the typical uh, main road of a city, more than 40 or 50 routes of microbuses going through that line. And that's because they go from a, a number of different places in one area, then just they all concentrate on the center to go to the other side, and then they just kind of open and, uh, and, and try to put people on door-to-door -door basis. That's a huge issue, especially on, on, the, on the node, on the center area. Uh, and that's why it's also very important to use synergies uh, for optimized infrastructure. What you see there on the on the right high end, uh, on the right hand side is the um, the transportation by by type of mode, and, and as you can see, railway is almost invisible there. This is not only Latin America; this is worldwide. So there's a huge opportunity to have very efficient transportation uh, for the future. Uh, the other important fact uh, is the number of people we can move. Uh, a metro system can move 50,000 passengers per hour per direction or more. 
and there's no other system that can move that amount of people. Uh, not even 20,000 uh, passengers per hour per direction can be, mo can be moved in other systems that are not uh, rail guided. So a tram can do it, uh, a light rail can do it. It's not possible to do it with buses, not even with BRTs. We, we don't get to that level of, of, uh, uh, of mobility. That doesn't mean that each of the different type of transportations, uh, types of transportation have uh, uh, their place and their opportunity, but we, we have to be clear that when you have to move big volumes, you have to go to a system that is guided, that is automated, and that, that is efficient. The first technology, and, and of course uh, we as Bombardier sell technology, uh, the first technology I'm going to talk about is the, our Metro, Metro Inovia 300, which is one of our families. Then we'll talk about the, the, the bigger type of metros. This is a metro that was designed specifically for, uh, for places in which flexibility and easy integration into the city is key. It's a, a system that could, can operate underground, elevated, or at grade. Uh, as you can see on that uh, image, the, the, the type of elevation uh, of guideway you need for the elevation is, is not that big compared to typical uh, trains. It's really small uh, for mainly two reasons, the size of the train but also the weight of the train. You will see in a second the, the, the type of weights we're talking about. With this kind of system we can move uh, passengers in the range of, of medium to almost a uh, high capacity metro systems, we could go up to 53,000 passengers per hour per direction. Uh, I know I, we're in a, a, I mean, people here are from the railway industry, but just to give an example, in case you don't have that reference, most of the metro systems in the world move less, most of the lines of the metro systems in the world move less than 50,000 passengers per hour per direction. What you have typically in big cities with very efficient systems is that line one uh, or, and line two probably uh, go to those levels, 50,000. The rest of the lines, and that's the case in Madrid, that's the case in Mexico City, and that's the case in, in, in pretty much every system I have seen, uh, lines three, four, five, six, etc., move probably 20,000 passengers per hour per direction or 25, but you don't have these high volumes uh, in every corridor. So uh, really to go above 53,000 passengers per hour per direction is a system that is really heavy, really big, and we're finding them, a lot of them in Asia, but, but that's not going to be the case for Latin America and that's not the case in most of the cities. And, and the other very important point is uh, the technology we use for, for uh, signaling. Uh, our CityFlow 650, uh, which I will talk about uh, a little bit more in a second, uh, allows for very short headways, which increases the capacity without increasing the, 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 the requirement for more infrastructure, bigger stations, etc. This is the train I'm talking about. Uh, we can go from one to six car trains. Uh, the empty weight, what I was referring to, is 20 tons, 20.5 tons. A similar train with similar uh, size uh, from our competitors and even ours uh, in, in other type of uh, systems go up to 40 or even 60 tons uh, per car. So you can see that it's dramatically uh, lower the, the, the weight and, and that helps us a lot in, in, a, in a significant number of places, especially on the size of the, of the guideways when we are uh, at an elevated mode and also on the, on, on the maintenance of the infrastructure when we have to, uh, to run over them, it's, the impact on them is significantly lower. This particular train has a floor height of 825 millimeters. The standard uh, for a metro system is 1.1 meters or 1.2. So that reduces also the, the size of the station. You can go with lower stations uh, and smaller. Uh, also, the, the, the radius of the curves. Uh, in mainline, we can go to 70 meters when the standard in the industry for a metro system is, is probably 120, 140, 
uh, and in the yards up to 35 meters. That reduces dramatically the, the excess uh, land acquisition when you are going through a city in which you have to have a, a tight turn uh, and, and that's why I say this is a system designed to really integrate into something that is already there and try to navigate through obstacles. It's not the best scenario. The best scenario would be, okay, let's plan a transportation system and put, and put the city over it, but that's not what happens. And finally, uh, just, just to give you the, the capacities I already talked about, when we go to a six-car train with a f uh, headway of 75 seconds, which is what we can do with our system, with our signal system, we can go up to 53,000 passengers per hour per direction. Uh, what, what makes this possible? I mean, how can we do that uh, that is different to the traditional metro? First of all is the linear induction motor. Uh, the linear induction motor is a system that we have developed a long time ago. Our first system uh, with this technology was implemented in Vancouver 25 years ago and has been operating there since then. Uh, the system is basically what you see there. Uh, you have uh, a flat area with with a winding uh, through which you you run the energy, and then on the on the track, what we install is uh, in this case aluminum a uh, third rail. It is not a uh, is not wired. It has no no type of energy. It's just a flat uh, aluminum uh, plank that we we fix to the train. We fix to the to the tracks. What it does is basically the, this motor, uh, through magnetic induction, uh, uh, basically you, is used to run the train and to break the train. Uh, so basically the, the, the wheels that we have on the side are only used to keep the train on the tracks and to guide the train as, as it goes to the tracks, but it's, it, the, the wheels are not used to, to, to run the train or to, or to break the train. That has significant advantage on, on the consumption of, of, uh, of energy and also on the, on the cost of maintaining the infrastructure. Additionally, because we don't have a, a very complex uh, bogey, bogey uh, is, is, is what you see here is the, the structure that has the four wheels, two axles and, and the entire motor system in it. Uh, because this motor is so simple we can have a, a, a bogey that is articulated so our axles uh, can uh, move and not be completely parallel one to the other all the time. That means that we reduce the, the, the stress on the track and on the, on the wheels and we increase the life of both. And that's also, sorry, what it makes it possible to have a 70 meter uh, curve radius on a main line or 35 meters on, on, a, on a, which is impossible with a, with a bogey that is completely fixed, uh, has uh, fixed axles. This is just a close-up look. Uh, this is how it looks. As you can see, these are also very small uh, wheels compared to traditional metros. These are probably 750 uh, millimeters versus almost one meter or, or slightly less. Uh, and this is the way it looks, the system looks, and this is the way the motor looks. The motor is mounted, uh, supported by these holes and, and these two holes in the front. And, and that's the way you mount it on top of the, of the bogey. So that's what allows for a little bit of flexibility and, and, and the turning of the, of the axles. This is the way it's installed. This is in a, in a test track, but it's pretty much the same. As you can see, the only thing you add is a support for, a, for, the, for the aluminum a plank you have here, and it, you just have to nivelate it. Uh, the installation is a little bit complex, but I think the, 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 the savings are, are tremendous. And, and basically what you have here is, a, in, in this case, a third rail. Uh, this, as I said, has no, no power injection, it's just uh, a, a flat aluminum uh, section. Additionally, and if you are thinking on a, on a tunnel system, an uh, underground system, because of the size of this uh, bogey and, and the fact that we can reduce the overall size of the train uh, with the same capacity, we can reduce 
uh, dramatically the, the, the sections of, on, on tunnels. Okay, that's the mid-sized metro system, as I said, up to 53 uh, passengers per hour per direction. What I'm going to talk about a little bit now is our higher capacity. What we have is a platform called Movia, uh, which is a different platform. This is a platform we have developed for uh, higher uh, capacities. And we have uh, 82,000 vehicles uh, running uh, all around the world. As you know, metro systems are quite peculiar and every metro wants to have their own specifications. They have their reasons. And, and we, what we have done with this platform is a standardized platform in terms of components, and, and you will see it in a, in a little bit. But then we modify and we adjust to the specific requirements of, of our client. Uh, we are installed uh, in more than 40 cities. And we have today, uh, which is one of the trends we see, and, and hopefully this is the trend that, that, that goes around the, the world as an, a driverless metros, we have today 588 kilometers of lines in operation. And we are the leader in terms of unattended train operation, not only with metros, but with a, a, a significant number of systems around the world. Okay, this is what I was talking about, the, the, the way we, we standardize our platform. What we have is, of course, our systems, our main systems, and our main components as standard. Uh, those we don't change. We keep with what we know, uh, and this is important for us and also for the client because that's the way we can guarantee reliability, availability, and a life cycle of 30 or 40 years, and we can prove it, and we can keep a track of what we have installed in the past. Of course, that goes with uh, a set of design principles that we keep uh, to make sure everything is, is uh, in line, but then we customize everything around it. So you have metros from 2.9 to 3.2 meters wide, you have metros from 20 meters to 23 meters or, or even more, uh, you have two car trains, three car trains, seven car trains, air car trains, you have five doors, uh, four doors per side, all that is what we customize and, and of course the level of automatization from a system that is fully uh, operated by a driver to an ATP in which you have an automated train protection, in which you have a driver, but you have a system that is basically protecting that the driver is doing what he's supposed to be doing, all the way to a uh, completely unattended train operation in which you basically have no one on site, uh, on board of the train, and the system runs automatically. Uh, one of the case studies, and, and, and a very significant one for us, is in November 2008, uh, Singapore LTA awarded Bombardier a, a, 20, a 298 million euro a contract and we're delivering 219 driverless Movia Metro system. We, we have delivered, sorry, a 219 driverless Movia Metro vehicles. A fully automated mode in, the, in our Movia a technology. A, it's a 40 kilometer long line uh, and will move. A, it's moving around half of a million passengers a, every day in Singapore. That's one of the, of the contracts in terms of heavy metros, fully automated, that we're running today. This is another one uh, in, in Shanghai, uh, another uh, Movia Metro. Uh, as you can see, they are not exactly the same. There are some, some changes on the structure and, and the way they look. But it's basically the same platform as I described. This is a, a system uh, running in Shanghai, Line 12. It's aluminum uh, and it runs up to 80 kilometers per hour. Five doors per train is a, is a quite a long train, uh, high capacities. Again, uh, another one, this is Delhi, uh, with some changes on the, on the structure and some changes on the bogey. This is a 25 kV uh, AC uh, power supply, which is not typical for metros. Metros are normally done on, on DC. Uh, but it, this is the case in Delhi, and we have used our Movia technology to, to implement this 25 kV uh, system. Uh, in this case, we, we can allow per train up to 1,200, almost 1,300 people uh, in, in standing capacity, plus the, the seats. 
All right, that's our family of metros. Uh, there's a, a significant number of metros in our portfolio, but these are the two basic families, our mid-sized metro designed to really get into the uh, into cities that are consolidated and fix issues in which you have uh, not uh, an easy way to go around the city, and our big capacity metros in which the infrastructure is needed to really go through from point A to B uh, fast uh, and with high capacities. Uh, talking about uh, demand and, and public transport, and, and the next section I'm going to talk about is how do we integrate even more flexible systems, probably not with the same capacities, but even more flexible systems in cities that are consolidated as, as these two, which are two uh, very important cities in, in Latin America. And as you can see, there's not a lot of space. Uh, and uh, the first one is the monorail, uh, or, or the one I want to talk about is the monorail. Uh, in its highest capacity, it could move up to 48,000 per hours per uh, passengers per hour per direction. We we believe the the sweet spot for a monorail is around 20,000 passengers per hour per direction. But uh, we can provide the client the. Uh, the ease of mind that if the, the system consolidates and it grows up to that level, we can still uh, deliver it. Uh, it's the is always elevated, so this system is designed to be elevated. Uh, but it's a very slender guideway, uh, which you will see in a minute, and the impact on on traffic, on surface traffic, is minimal. Uh, it's very easy to install and fast to install compared to other type of technologies and it is in our opinion a very good alternative for systems like the one you see there a BRT which are already full and need to go to the next step and they don't have the capacity to grow more uh, with the, the very good uh, additional benefit that not only you are moving more people you're moving more people in a in a more efficient and faster way because you don't have to stop on every on every red light but additionally you re, you return one or two or four as this is the case here lines to the surface uh, traffic so so cars can move this is the way it looks. Uh, we can go from two to eight cars. Uh, it's a very uh, light uh, weight uh, car. It's 14 tons. We can go up to 6% gradients and a minimal horizontal curve of 46 meters. Uh, up to 48,000 passengers per hour per direction if we put the maximum uh, configuration, which is seven trains, seven car trains. And uh, again, we go with our City Flow 650 with a headway of 75 seconds. This is the way uh, the, the bogey looks and, and the motor, uh, which is, uh, I put it here because it's completely untraditional. What you have here is the two uh, wheels that are basically supporting the system and, 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 and are also the ones that uh, move the system forward. And then you have three small wheels on each side, which are basically the ones that stabilize the system and, and keep it on, on, on top of the, of the, of the beam. The motor, the, what we have here is a, a, a motor with a permanent magnets, so the, the stator on, on, on the outside of the motor is not a typical winding uh, winded, uh, stator, it's, it's a, it has permanent magnets. What it does, it allows us to have a very small motor, high capacity, a high torque, but very small, and we can fit it inside the wheels. So basically what we have in, in a system like this, you have the support and the propulsion and the motor is installed inside of these two wheels. So basically we, we have a very compact uh, propulsion system and that allows us to move uh, the system forward. Uh, I'll, I'll spend two minutes on the City Flow 650, uh, which is our CBTC technology, uh, control based, uh, communication based train control. and, and what we have developed is what we believe is the most efficient CVTC in the market today. It's a proven technology. We have been installing it in, in uh, several places. We have huge contracts today in London Metro, 
we we finished recently Madrid Line One, and and, and we're doing a number of other uh, implementations. Uh, what it allows as an, as a system, as an operation, is a very flexible configuration that can be uh, changed as the system grows. And we also have a number of algorithms that that make it easy to uh, improve the energy consumption as we change the way the system operates automatically. To talk about our CBTC and, the, and this version of CBTC we are talking about, uh, one important thing is to, to look at how it has changed from the, first of all, the, the, the fixed block system to the traditional CBTC to the CBTC we have today. The fixed block system, as you know, you had you had uh, X, uh, every such uh, meters on the track, a valise that, that was sending information to the train, so you had the necessary separation, the necessary blocks between uh, train A and train B, so there was no, uh, no, no way of them crashing. What CBTC did in, uh, to the industry basically was to take away all these fixed blocks on the tracks and what it did is basically put the, 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 the communication between one train, the control center, and the second train. It controlled it and basically created the gap between the two trains through a communication-based system, which basically allowed to run the system without these fixed blocks, and, uh, and that gives, it gave a lot of flexibility as you needed to reduce the headways. You could do it easily. The next generation of what we're doing today is no, we, we are not only running with communication-based uh, systems, therefore with no fixed blocks, but also the, the, the gap we have between trains changes based on the operation. So what we have is basically what you see in blue is the, the space we need based on the speed that changes according to speed. If you are going very, low, very slow, you pretty much don't need any. And then as you go uh, to a higher speed, you need a, a, a long space to break the train. And that changes according to the speed of, of this train and this train. And it's constant, constantly calculated. And on top of that, you have other, uh, other spaces that are created based on safety options, uh, the, the, the potential uh, error in position of the train, etc. So you are always guaranteeing that the train A is not going to hit train B in an emergency situation. And that changes uh, constantly. What this gives us is uh, a system that can run at 75 seconds uh, headway easily, but on top of that can recover when you have a potential uh, issue on, on the track. So if one of the trains, if the train in front has been stopped in one station for whatever reason, somebody is blocking the door, uh, whatever happened, that the train took longer to, to run, instead of pushing back your entire system and basically losing those seconds or, or minutes forever in your operation, what this system is capable of doing is, as it recognizes that you're running late, it starts recovering time based on these algorithms, and then you go basically back to your normal operation and recover the time. Another system that is also very important for us, uh, and, and we have been promoting it in, in not only in new uh, greenfield systems, but also on brownfield systems, is our storage and recovery of energy systems. We have both a, a on the side for the guideways and on board. And what we do is basically we use in a more efficient way the, the re regenerative braking we have on our trains and we can uh, transfer it to the operation and to the trains. We, we have uh, been able to save 30% of the energy consumption just by installing this type of systems. I think uh, when we do the study and basically what we do, uh, and you can look at it here, we take the client's uh, system, we see where the injections of energy are, and, and then we just start playing with them and see where we can improve the, how we can improve this, uh, the efficiency by adding uh, systems like this, which act like uh, an additional uh, 
power converter, but without having to be uh, connected to anything else other than the catenary or the third rail, depending on the case. And that way we, we save uh, energy uh, in both existing systems and new systems. Uh, the the two uh, the two types of of energy savers both on board and and on side track are modulated uh, through our a simulation tool which is called energy plan and we invite every operator and every system that that, that is thinking on putting a, a a new track to ask us to do this analysis i think it's a, it has been very important in a number of aspects and and we can deliver significant savings on, over the life of your system Coming back to the to the monorail for a second this is the way it looks while it is in, in construction and uh, as it looks when it's finished. It's a very slim guideway. Uh, you have uh, this type of, of, uh, of, of beams being installed with very not very heavy uh, uh, cranes because what you have here is a, is a, a guideway that is probably two tons per meter compared to other type of light rails which would be 10 or 50 tons per meter depending on the type of system you're installing. So it's very easy to install, very fast to install. Construction methods are not that complex. We do have a number of, of uh, sections that we create, that we, that we have patented and, and are our property, but the, as you can see, this is not a very complex installation. It's in a, an open area. What we we do is either pretense or post tense the, the the sections, and then we we put the concrete over them. One of the big uh, criticisms uh, we have heard for the monorail, and that they were probably right and and, and correct on the past, but it's not the case anymore, is the the switching. The switching in, in, in monorails has uh, become simpler. This is a switch in, in position uh, of changing tracks. So basically you are coming from the track on the, on the left and you end up on the track on the, on the right. And this is when it is not applied and basically you have the track A moving uh, straight and track B moving straight. And what we do is basically it, it pivots around this point and just takes uh, uh, the other way. This is one of the more complex switches we have and, and so far we don't have that many installed. Uh, this is a, a, a Y type switch, so basically you can go from two, coming from two directions, going to two different directions. This is the way it operates, and basically when this uh, small flap goes down, the system completes the, the switching, green light goes on and you can continue, and, and the time you saw the, the way it moves is pretty much a real motion time, so it would be the time, that would be the time it takes to change from position A to position B. The other big criticism for monorails is what do you do when you are in, a, in an incident, for example, when you have a fire, um, in which you cannot get to the next station, which is an emergency. Uh, what we do normally, I mean, step one, if you have a, a train that is blocked and cannot move, you go and recover it on the, on the same beam. So you basically come from here or from there pull it or, 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 or bring it back. If that cannot be done, you, step two would be to bring another train on this area and basically open doors, cross through here uh, in, a, in a beam like this one and just get to the next one and, and leave. If that's not possible and you are in an emergency in which nothing else is working, then uh, what we have is this walkway. Uh, and as you can see, it's not I mean, it's, it's, it's not the, the, the nicest way to get to the next station, but it's completely proven and completely accepted by every standard, both in North America, South America, uh, Asia, and Europe. So you basically walk and start walking here. If for any reason you fall, you fall to this other area, uh, which you have a few, a few centimeters here, is less than a meter. It will not be fun and you will not be happy, but you will not die. So. Uh, 
that's very important uh, in every kind of systems, and we always put this kind of a uh, of a uh, guide with a uh, walking areas on our systems. We don't go without them. Uh, we just consider it's not safe. Any other recovery system that is either activated by someone uh, that has to come and, and pick you up is not safe enough in our opinion so that's why we have this and it's not this is not to be used but in an emergency case we can use it so just to make sure I'm I think I'm already on time uh, I'll go very quickly uh, to what uh, the last point is and we have to make sure that uh, as I said at the beginning we have different transport modes that are working together and not trying to steal each other's passengers. So one of the key technologies we have developed for this is the our Primo system. Primo is a, a system that basically what we have uh, on, on the road, uh, depending if it's a tram, a bus, or a car, even a car, what we have below the, the concrete or below the asphalt is a system running in high tension energy going through it, generating a, a, a field, a magnetic field, that then is picked up by the train or by the bus or by the car, and that magnetic field is converted back into energy, feed it into our system, and then we run. This is the way we do it. Uh, the same technology and the same system can be used for trams, buses, and cars. And, and if you have a car equipped with that and it runs on a, on, a, on a road that is designed for buses, for example, it could run forever because it's just constantly recharging. That's the way it works. And that's the way we see the future in really having multiple systems running uh, with the same technology. I, I, I won't spend too much time on, on this. Uh, just Just to let you know that we have a center of excellence on Mayhem. We have already a system running in Augsburg with a tram. We already have a number of systems running both for cars and for buses. And, and we have already sold a primal system for buses and for trams. So it's not a, a, a pilot or a, a development system. It's an already proven, ready to go, already sold system. So as a conclusion, uh, and with this I'm done, uh, we have to have flexible, space-saving, attractive uh, systems for cities that are already consolidated and growing, and we believe that having this type of technology is going to make it a lot easier for cities to integrate a high-capacity uh, transportation. Uh, we are doing everything we can to have a superior performance with a lower investment and with a, a faster implementation, which is always what is needed when you have to, to react uh, in these cities that are growing at the rate uh, we see are growing. And we are looking into systems that converge different type of transportations with the same technology, trying to maximize the experience of the, of the user and the, cost, the final customer, so you can go from point A to point B uh, through a different type uh, of transportation modes in the easiest way and uh, with uh, the less energy consumption possible. Thank you very much.